right, here we are. Great, uh, great ride up, no problems, and uh, we didn't pass anybody, and they all got here before us, so I um, guess we'll go in and check out Chuck's collection. It's uh, supposed to be great. The last seven of these cars were full fender, meaning they eliminated the cycle fender and closed the front wheels. The reason for that was that um, in Grand Prix racing, they eliminated uh, the use of cycle fender cars. You couldn't run a cycle fender car. This car belonged to a gentleman by the name of David Coffin, another Alex Finnegan find. We went to uh, Hyannis, and the fellow that had the car that was selling it for David was a gentleman by the name of David McGraw. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but David is an excellent, excellent restorer. Uh, David also has the distinction of being a McGraw, the correct McGraw, so like McGraw Hill. And very, very nice guy. And we're going around the car, and he's, well, Mr. Coffin wanted this. Hi, we're here with uh, Chuck Swager checking his collection out. We're going to look at a few cars of his that are, are really special, things that he's been collecting over many years. Um, uh, for your viewers, this is Classic Drive Television. Chuck, it's great to meet with you. Nice to see you, Dirk. Great. So tell us, we've got some wonderful cars here, but in specifically, we've got some really neat Mercedes here. Tell us about those. Well, I, I think all Mercedes are pretty neat, but the older ones are the ones that everybody is looking for these days. This is a, this is a 1967 300 SL, and it's the Roadster version of the car. This was the first year that Mercedes built the Roadster. Uh, and uh, they're wonderful driving cars. This was really the first car that I bought as a collector car. Uh, if we don't mind a commercial, Alex Finnegan helped me find this car from Paul Russell, the wonderful guy. And uh, the car was, had been restored. Actually, I, I had seen it being restored some years before. And unfortunately, the owner had passed away and the widow was selling the car, so that was to my advantage and unfortunately to his. Uh, this particular car has reg wheels, which are the knockoff wheels, and it has European headlights, uh, both of which are very, very nice. Uh, the European headlights are terrific because at night you can actually see where you're going. Ah. What a, an amazing idea. And these cars are of an era, and at a time in Germany when uh, V8 engines were very rare, although BMW used them. Most of them were straight sixes, long stroke sixes, um, a lot of power from them. This is early fuel injection. The, um, the, these cars were way ahead of their time. Driving one today, it's like, wow, these guys really knew what they were up to. And uh, they're, they're very fun to drive. I've driven this on a number of rallies. Uh, pretty bulletproof car. They like to run so, and run. So 1957 was the first year of the, the, the open top car. Of then. the open top car. Prior right. to that, as a matter of fact, we can go over and take a look at, prior to that, it, its cousin, of course, was the Mercedes Gullwing. Ah. And this is, uh, you know, been, most people know what a Gullwing, or at least they've heard of it, uh, known for that, for their, the way the doors open on the car. So this appears to have matching luggage, matching the interior? It does, that's right. Yeah. And the, the challenge with these cars, we, we kid and say, we like to take ladies with short skirts in this car because climbing over and getting into the car, it's very comfortable once you're there. But getting in is sort of a challenge and out is even more fun. So as you can see, this has the original, the, the regular wheels and the, the, the gull wings never came with European headlights. So uh, it's a shame, but uh, that's the way they were. And the engines in these cars are both exactly the same. Three so, liters making 230, 40 horsepower. So very respectable horsepower. Now, were these uh, principally exported to the States, or were they worldwide? Oh, I think worldwide, uh, Dirk. They made about 1,500 of each model. Now, this is a 1956. All the gull wings were exactly the same. Uh, they made these cars, 1953, uh, was 54 was really the first year of production, through 1957. 
57 was the only year they made both models. Ah. And then they stopped making the Gullwing, probably because of the expense involved. A lot of stuff going into the, uh, into the doorways. Now this is not an alloy body, right? No, oh, no, I steel? wish it were. They made four of those. Oh, ah, okay. And uh, they, that would be in Ralph Lauren's league, and he owns one of the alloy body cars. Ah, very, very good. So when did you acquire this car? Shortly after the, the 57? <clears throat> well, th this, was, th this whole thing became sort of a good idea that got out of control. Oh, you nice. know how that works, oh, right? Yeah, absolutely. We, gee, we, we love the 300. Uh, we love the Roadster. Uh, what's next? Oh, I don't know. Something presented itself. Maybe a Jaguar or maybe a Porsche or maybe some other stuff. And it just was one of those things that um, got out of control. It's a good idea. Well, so really the style, the body, the, the uh, province of the car is what drew you to any one particular car then. <clears throat> well, I, I, was, uh, I was always uh, involved with cars. My, my dad did the books for the Chevy dealer, Olds dealer, and Nash dealer back in the 50s and 60s. And so growing up, I was, always loved cars. And all of these were really cars that just stuck out in my mind that I thought they were really pretty special. In the case of the, the 300 SLs, you have a lot of people that would agree with that. They're, yeah. they're very famous and they're, they're very sought after. Some of the Jaguars, I mean, you know, all, all these cars are, are pretty much um, very desirable and people look for them. And uh, I, try to, I try to drive all these cars. That's the reason they're parked the way they are. Yeah. So they can go right out the door and uh, get Terrific. some exercise during the summer. Uh, they do not have snow tires, so they don't go out in the winter. I would imagine not. No. So what do we have next? <laughs> okay, uh, going on, now this is the British side of the world. Uh, this is a Jaguar XK150S. And uh, maybe you could give me a hand here sure. because it's a long reach. Just put that up there in the keeper right there. Oh. Oh. There you go. Uh, again, period for the, in this period where people were building, uh, were building automobiles. The British cars were all known for long stroke six cylinder engines, typically dual overhead cams, meaning there was a, a camshaft driving the intake and another, another one driving the exhaust valves. The 150 was the last of the XK120, 140, 150 series. It's the only one that has roll up windows. It was sort of the, you know, the end of the, of the progression. And the S model has three carburetors rather than just two. Um, this was uh, one of a couple cars that I've shown. It, it all started off innocently enough. It was, uh, I wonder what, it, it looks like it's a really great car. Maybe I should show it and find out what's wrong. Right, right. So we found out there wasn't a lot wrong and fixed all that, and it, it's going on from there. Great, great cars to drive. Um, they're British, they're not German. Uh, they have their own characteristics to them. They tend to be a little lighter. Uh, the interesting thing about the 300s, they look like they should weigh a lot. They don't. They're just very cleverly designed. Ah. Um, and the British cars, I mean, this, this was a very nice job. This, was, uh, this car was restored in California. It had been sitting apart in someone's garage. The fellow that owned it uh, was going to restore it when he retired. And I'm sure when he retired, he looked at what's that pile of junk in the corner right. and sold it to a gentleman who was an expert Jaguar restorer uh, whose name is uh, John Pollock. And John's done a number of cars for the movie industry people and the like. And this has been a this was a very successful car. This is very it. looks very correct. In, uh, all it is. Specs. It's a good car. So uh, and you've shown this and uh, and driven this a fair amount. <clears throat> oh, I try to drive them all, Dirk. You know that's what it's about. I didn't really buy any of these cars uh, just to show them. Sure. I mean, they're all they they were bought to drive. They've been great investments, and. Um, it's worked out well. Hi, I'm Dirk Burrows, and I'm on the set of Classic Drive Television. And to that end, we'd like to have you here too. Classic Drive is having a contest, and we're gonna invite three enthusiasts with their cars to spend the day with us, learn all about them, and who knows, maybe even become a car star themselves. So, get your pictures together, tell us about your car, and send it to us to the address below. And make sure you check out our website and Facebook page for other details about this contest and upcoming episodes at Classic Drive Television. Hope to see you here. All right, we're back. So we're taking a look at uh, some of the Jags, and uh, we've just uh, spent a little time looking at this XK150. 
and some of this DNA ended up going into the next series. Chuck, we've got the, uh, a very early E-type here. Why don't you tell us about that? This, well, it, it, to that point, Dirk, this is 1959 technology. Skipping forward two years, this is the first year that Jaguar built the E-type. Um, and as you can see, there was quite a transition. Although under the hood, it, it's very, very similar. Uh, they stuck with the long stroke six design for the engine. This particular car is one of about 335 that were known as outside bonnet release cars. And there's a key that goes in there to release the bonnet. And under the hood, again, typically the long stroke dual overhead cam six cylinder that the British were very, very fond of. Uh, this car came out of California, it had been restored. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, the gentleman who restored the 150, John Pollock, went to look at this car for me. And he said, Chuck, you know, uh, there, there's one thing you should know about this car. And he said that both of these cars had four-speed transmissions, but non-synchronized first gear. So they were known as crash boxes or moss boxes. Right. And he said, but with this particular car, with the E-Type, Chuck, Somebody had gone to great expense to do it very properly, so you can't tell, but they replaced the MOS box with a four-speed synchro transmission, uh. which you're really gonna like. And he said, oh, and by the way, the original matching number transmission comes in a box with the car, but I don't think you're gonna wanna put it in. And after driving this, I agree with him completely. Uh, it's a very nice driving car, car's quite correct. <coughs> it runs bias ply tires, those are, uh, uh, Dunlop road speeds, which are the correct tires for the, for the car. And for having bias ply tires, it handles beautifully. Yeah. Really yeah. does. Great driving car. So between these two year periods, um, were there a great deal of engine changes or about the same output for the XK150 to the E-Type? Uh, the, the 1959 has a 3.4 liter six. There were some 3.8 liters. They're very rare. There were about 35 of them that were made in the, in the 150 series. But then the 1.8 is what was prevalent in the E-Type up until 1964 when they went to the 4.2 liter. So yeah, they changed displacement slightly. I would think from a performance standpoint, if you were racing the car, there might be a minor difference, but uh, from normal driving, you wouldn't notice it. Now, is this a heavier car than the XK? That's a very good question, Dirk. I really don't know. My guess would be they're about the same weight. Um, yeah. You know, there's not a lot of variance in them. Uh, they're, they're wonderful cars to drive. Well, certainly a, an updated dash, very refined, really sort of coming into the 60s, uh, aircraft style um, uh, switches. Um, uh, uh, and, a, and a very nice center console, really um, uh, sort of finished off with that, uh, with that aluminum there. Quite a, quite a car when it first came out, wasn't it? It was. They yeah. did a great job with this car. Uh, you know, I had the occasion to do the Mille Amelia with a good friend of mine, and we did it in a C-type Jaguar. Oh, wow. Yeah, which was really great, 1953. And uh, that's, that's quite a th thrilling ride. The, I'll the bet whole, it is. The whole that's... thing is pretty crazy. They had 430 cars in the rally. Is that, that year right? We did wow. It. That's a lot of people trying to get down the road all at the same time. So our next car, um, uh, following in the, uh, the tradition of the British, is, a, is an Aston Martin. And, and I think, you know, this has got to be one of the, well, of course, this is a, a Bond-like car, right? Well, yes, it is. The, the sign on it says, this is not James Bond's car. That was a DB5. This is a DB4. You know, if I didn't know you better, Dirk, I would say that you really like the British cars. I don't oh, know why well, I know, get that opinion, but yes, you yeah. seem to. They're all in a row here. So. Oh, I see. That's yeah. What, yeah, it was a setup. Um, the, the primary difference between the DB4 and DB5, the DB4 is actually alloy body. This is an uh -huh. aluminum body. The DB5s and 6s were steel. So for the guys that like to race these in vintage racing, uh, the 4 is really a car that they look for. Uh, they're very nice driving cars, long wheelbase. Uh, uh, we did a 1,000 mile, 1,500 mile tour in New England. My wife and I in this, it was a pleasure to drive. It was really great. Um, this car also, as British, uh, keeping with British tradition, 
uh, a long stroke six dual overhead cam engine. And they run, when they're running right, they run beautifully. Uh, all these cars run very well. I try not to touch them or improve them because they, they are all doing a great job. You want to put the crutch in that and you could save my arm from the rest of the day. There we yeah, are. There you go. And um, a pleasure to drive, very comfortable. It's actually a four, it's, a, it's almost a two plus two, right. although you have to have small children or somebody that has no legs to sit in the back. Uh. Um, but they are very, very nice driving automobiles. Uh, all these cars, I, this was another car that sat in someone's garage for years, uh, just sitting. And they finally decided, well, maybe we ought to do something with this. And in this particular case, it was in California. They, uh, they found somebody that was a professional to come in and rec recommission the car and got it running again. Um, Alex Finnegan shows up and everything. This was another one of the, we bought this car uh, and it was partially restored and we finished the restoration once we got the car. And the gentleman, uh, my, my friend John Pollock, the, uh, the fellow who did the 150 Jaguar, uh, I would happen to be talking to him one day and told him what, we, uh, what I had purchased. And he said, oh, is that silver? Yes. He said, well, I did the interior in that car. So it falls into the category of it's a small world, sure especially is. in the vintage car world. You, yeah. you run into the same people again and again. And it's a real pleasure to do that because you make some great friends and have a lot of fun. Well, you know, um, uh, it's amazing how classic car ownership transcends economies, uh, um, where you are in life. If you have a love for it, you immediately have an affinity for, for others who, who feel the same way. That's and true. Um, and uh, you know it's funny I can't remember names but I can sure remember cars. <laughs> what they is that a silver DV4? Oh yeah. Yeah, that yeah, must be yeah. I remember you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. Well, there you, you, we've made a lot of friends. Uh, the other thing that I mean I try to drive all these cars at least during the summer months to get them all out on the road. Uh, I we've also done a number of rallies that some are more competitive than others. And uh, that's great fun. And you meet, some, you meet the, some of the same people, like interests, and it's a wonderful time. Well, it's, it, is a, it is amazing the people you meet out there and uh, how many cars are actually being preserved and, and the, uh, this move towards keeping cars as original as possible. Yes. Um, uh, you know, I think that's a great thing because, you know, some of, uh, sometimes cars are becoming over-restored. And I think that we've seen that curve and we yep. start to see people um, look for originality. Um, uh, well, as they say, they're only original once. That's right. That's right. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to show us these cars. Um, it's my pleasure. Uh, we'd love to come back and see some more sometime. Pick a good day, Dirk. Come back and drive one. Well, or well, more. Oh, there you go. I'm Dirk Bros. This is Classic Drive Television. We visited the Chuck uh, Schwager collection. We'll be back.